I like this one. I'm gonna keep it underneath. All right. Well, welcome, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Matt Butler with the Good Foundation, and um, I'm sure we'll have some some more people trickling in. Just come on in, folks. We got pizzas back there, so does at the so does at the bar. Help yourselves. Um, and uh, we've got uh, Elise Daniel here tonight Hi. from uh, Cincinnati Red Bike. Yes. Mm. And uh, <laughs> Elise uh, went to Copenhagen um, earlier this year. Uh, for some training with uh, Portland State University, and they've got a long acronym for their training. Elise will tell you all about it. <laughs> We're also live streaming um, as well, and um, we'll have, uh, after she does her presentation, we'll have Q&A, and then um, it's just kind of informal. Um, everybody can, um, can chat with each other and share stories, and we'll stick around uh, any questions, uh, anything you'd like to talk about. Um, but it'll just be kind of like a, a, a mixer mingle um, and uh, we'll, we'll shut off the live stream before we go to that. So, so welcome everyone, uh, Elise Daniel. Hey. hey, hey. <laughs> Fun. Oh, I gotta remember where my clicker is. Boom. Um, well, hey, I don't know this community as well, the Vision Zero community, so I'm very excited to like meet you all today and chat with you and share a little bit about uh, my trip to Copenhagen and just a little bit about myself and just also Q&A wise like feel free to fire whatever questions curiosities you have off whether it be about the trip whether it be about red bike whether it be about me or just like something you want to post to the group I'm just here kind of to share my experience and share some encouragements um, because we all kind of are advocating and fighting for similar things or if not the same thing and so I just you know this is a space where we get to like all stand on our little soapboxes and like rally cry together. Uh, I'm treating it like that, if that's cool. Um, but yeah, uh, so I'm Elise, I'm the engagement manager at Red Bike. So I do a lot of outreach, engagement, community events, bike rides, um, any programming with partners or just programming in general, which is like, how do we work with community members to bring bike share access to them, make it easier for folks in their communities or their clientele to be, um, to feel encouraged to ride red bike, to feel like it's for them as well, and to be as informed about it as they can. And we do that in as many fun ways and cool ways as we can. Um, and I'm always down to do fun partnerships. Earlier this year, we partnered with Queen City Bike to do these community bike routes where we provided 40 different rides throughout, routes throughout the city of Cincinnati and Northern Kentucky that start and end at red bike stations and kind of connect people to streets that are fun and enjoyable, safe urban routes. So things like that, where they can, you know, you can do, get that on your phone, you can print that out, you can eventually find a booklet in a local coffee shop or bike shop near you to, to navigate uh, those routes as well. So just fun partnerships with um, community folks that are like-minded. Um, but then also we're expanding, Red Bike's in the middle of an expansion right now. And so working with the neighborhoods that we're expanding to, to make sure that they're informed about Red Bike, know what's going on and that they're a part of the process when the station's coming to their community, that they get to decide where those things go. So a lot of my work is working with people um, to kind of share as much information as I can and learn as much from them as I can too. Um, I also, Red Bike is um, a part of the Better Bike Share Partnership. Um, we were a living lab city for the past three years. We got a big old grant to support a lot of our equity and access work, which is a lot of the focus of our, uh, the engagement side of things. Um, and so we are connected to a number of other communities and cities throughout um, the nation um, or the continent, let's say, um, that are very, or like a lot of their bike share work is oriented around how do we make sure it's encouraging and accessible to lots of people. And we're also, uh, this past year, with NACTO, the North American Transportation City Officials. Everybody's got a long name. Uh, <laughs> um, they have a Transportation Justice Fellowship. And this past year or so, I uh, was also a fellow um, with, with that crew. And I'll be a coach this upcoming year with the incoming fellows. So again, connected to a larger community of people that care about transportation, justice, advocacy, et cetera, all based around equity, access, engagement, and just making sure people can get the things that they need, can get around to the places they want to, and feel supported. Yeah. Um, so why the heck am I here talking to you about Denmark, uh, or about Copenhagen? So very fortunate to, 
I've known of Matt and of Debu Good for years, but I was like, you know what, I gotta meet this guy. And so earlier this year, I was like, hey, we should have coffee, we should chat. And then sharing all the different things that we're working on, um, I learned a little bit more about how Debu Good does a lot of support, or does a lot of, um, I would say advocacy work with transportation officials or like people within the transportation realm that care um, and just getting them a little bit more education, a little bit more resources outside of our region, um, just so that like our tool belts can be a little bit more nuanced, can be a little bit bigger, can be, you know, a little bit more helpful and just we get to be exposed and see no, new different things. Um, and so in that conversation, we uh, talked about this Denmark trip with Portland State University and Trek, which is their transportation research and education center. Again, long names. Uh, <laughs> but there was a study abroad class that they offered uh, where we would spend a little bit of time in Copenhagen and we spent a little bit of time in Malmo, Sweden, um, and also in northern Denmark. So I'm going to share a little bit from my time there. Um, and, but I really did have a good time. These are just some Instax pictures that I took. Um, I met a really, my roommate during the trip uh, works for PBOT, the Portland Bureau of Transportation, does a lot of quick build stuff. So we were like buddies immediately. We took a little side trip to Amsterdam. That was fun. Um, but yeah, just like a re I had a really good time. I learned a lot, a lot of, um, uh, I spent a lot of time, we spent a lot of time hearing from different architects, planners, people. The class was based around sustainable transportation and land use. So we met a mix of people um, from like traffic safety planners to you know, architects to kind of like architects that do a lot more creative, culturally nuanced work and a lot of things based around like pedestrian plazas and things that are more oriented around how do we make this make sense for the user based on what their needs are. Um, so a lot of really cool, interesting people, very fortunate to be in a lot of the rooms that we were in, um, and I don't take that for granted. And I, you know, we established some good connections with folks during that time and um, still remain in contact with a few folks, uh, the Archilab folks, which is the last, almost the last photo. I'll share a little bit more about them, but they were the, the creatively, culturally uh, influenced folks that I felt the most uh, akin to. I'd love to go hang out with them again, maybe live there for a year or two and work for them. <laughs> um, yeah, what did I learn? I learned a lot of cool stuff. I come from the world of bikes. I am a, like a bicyclist, I'm a commuting cyclist, and I play like silly bike sports and just like ride around on a bike a lot. And I work, I, I like to call myself a bike share accomplice. Uh, <laughs> anything that's like rallying against, like rallying with like uh, being that gateway bike for folks um, before they decide whatever they're going to do next in the bike realm. Um, so I don't know a ton within the transportation realm. So this realm, so this was a really good experience for me to like kind of learn a little bit more when it comes to buses and light rail and trains and land use especially was a very different space for me. Um, so I'll go through just a couple of these pictures just to like, I'll share like little tidbits and please feel free to ask me questions about them after. Um, but so the, I'll go left to right, I guess. Um, the first one is with the Metro. We got to meet with the bus service folks. They also run the, uh, the ferry bus. So there's just a ferry, nine stops along the harbor. They also run that as well as the bus system that extends along the five finger plan that goes from the city center out to the different suburbs, um, which also have these cycle super highways. So just like raised cycle tracks that extend from downtown core area out into rural communities or more suburban communities, which was really rad. Um, so the bus service, we're getting to be in, you know, hour, two hour long meetings with folks and asking them all sorts of questions and hearing all of the, what they've got planned for the next couple of years. Archilab folks, they took us on an amazing bike tour, just wandering around the city, highlighting different, you know, pedestrian plazas um, and just spaces where bikes are, they, they, I'll show it a little bit later, but like bike, bike counters and things like that. The picture to the furthest to the right is um, an incredible traffic garden. I know that the Dayton community and Tri-State Trails are working on a traffic garden there and it's gonna be incredible. Well, this was like next top tier for me. Like there's like, like little le legit traffic signals and signs. And if you can, if you, it's a little blurry, but there's a little kid on the tiniest little bike just shooting out. <laughs> yeah. um, so there was, it was really activated. There was probably like 20 little kids like wandering around in their families. They got traffic signals. They got roundabouts in the space. It was pretty incredible to see. What do you mean for bikes? 
for bikes and I mean for bikes there were scooters there were just like people walking and like kids were actually like oh I'll wait my turn oh, to go nice. it was very cool yeah, so so for not to learn, not what's that yeah absolutely the, there was even a section that was just a bunch of different symbols that you would see on the roadway or like kind of in, intersections or things like that just so folks can little kids or young people could get a little bit more familiarized with like what does this mean how do what do i do when i see this sign that kind of a thing yeah mm -hmm. um we met with the danish uh technical institute folks and it was all about that that was a cool one because it's all like transportation work that's oriented around technology so in copenhagen um, in Denmark, that a lot of folks use the Hovinger. I'm forgetting the name of it right now. It's an inflatable helmet. So it's like a collar that's around. Uh, I would call it a collar. I don't know that everybody else would call it that. So you see folks with this like black collar like around their necks and should they, you know, have to make an abrupt stop or should they have to, you know, they be in like an incident that it quickly inflates and kind of protects their head. Um, you may have seen this. I feel like I saw it a lot like 10 years ago or so. Yeah. So a lot of people wear those there. Not necessarily a lot of helmets in the scene, but definitely a lot of, uh, I saw a lot of those. And so the, some of the researchers, the master's students at the school were using, working with that company to um, use the technology for that, use the, every time that, that helmet inflates, there's a little data point that comes up. And so they were able to track like, are there problem intersections and things like that where those are, that's happening more often. So some of the, we were able to learn some cool things about how master students were working with technology when it comes to transportation as well um, and like just what was priority for folks. We went on a few more bike tours and you'll see a little bit closer close up of this um, cool bike parking situation, this bike racks. I did not know that I was going to learn so much about bike parking. That is not as big of an issue for us here. I think so yet. in like Los, yet. yet, yet, exactly. But definitely in like Los Angeles and New York and Chicago, it's a little bit more of an uh, a issue that they have to think about. But here, the level and nuance to bike parking was like a very cool thing to learn. Like the entire time that we were talking with uh, Metro, who runs the transportation, I'm sorry, the train system, like the subway system there, like so much of what one of the individuals was talking to about was just around like the layers of work that she and consideration her team put into bike parking when it comes to like how do we have enough where they just be this whole entire space would be bike parking outside of like um, a building or like outside of the subway you know um, and how do we make sure we have enough how do we make sure it's not super close to the entry because people have to flow out and like how do we make sure that if we don't, if people aren't comfortable with like parking, bike parking that's on street, they want it to be secured parking. But how do we make sure they know that it's available to them if it's underground? So just the level of nuance that came in with that was really cool. And I hope that we have that problem soon yeah. and one day. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and then in Malmo, Sweden, we uh, there was some uh, there was a lot of conversations both in Sweden and in um, Aros and Albor um, in northern Denmark about do you go with light rail or do you go with bus rapid transit? And so this was a bus uh, in Malmo that um, could go either direction. And they're, 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 um, they went with bus rapid transit and they used it as like, like you can serve, when you don't have a fixed line, you can serve more people and there's a more, your, your system is a little bit more malleable. Um, and so also with this two-sided bus, there was a lot of more um, opportunities um, for changing up those different lines for folks as well. Also, the subway system in Copenhagen is driverless. Um, and there was a whole conversation with uh, unions and how do we still support. Uh, there was a lot of conversation with the, the metro system about how do we still support our unions and advocate best for them and like making sure their teams are still employed, et cetera, because that was a huge concern. Um, but they do feel like there's a lot of cost savings also within with the driverless system and also just like um, they could run it more often, which is cool. Um, land use stuff was very new for me. So the, the picture to the left um, is on top of this parking garage that's in the picture just to the right of it. Giant parking garage, like seven stories high. It was actually a very beautiful parking garage. Uh, not that you get to say that that often. It was like metal on the sides with like these cutout holes, like this artistic design along the side, but then also there's this plant life that's growing through it. And then the staircases, there's elevators too, but the staircases on either side, 
there's like a silly game where you can like tap the button and you can sprint to the top as fast as you can. So people are using it for like exercise and things like that. Um, there's a lot of multi use of like, how do we, one, Copenhagen, Denmark, very active community, a lot of things based around like healthy lifestyles and just being out um, and moving about. Um, so yeah, the cool racing games up the side of the staircases, but then at the very top there's a playground and like adult, like adult fitness kind of areas. There's like trampolines in the grounds, there's things that we could climb up. Um, it was really cool. And just for all that to be at the very top of the space um, and the buildings that are in the background of of here, you can't see it that great, but those two buildings, they were old silos, old silos, and they just like made them into very swanky, very expensive, even for Copenhagen, very expensive apartments <laughs> and condos, which was really cool too, to see a reuse of silos in, in the structural building space. But this is, um, it was really amazing to see a use of like a playground on top of a parking area in a space that's really compact with a lot of apartments and residential areas. Um, the picture right next to that is just like tr uh, bike parking on trains. Uh, we love it. Um, and so these little loops that stick out, you just put your rear wheel into those. So that's inside the train. Inside the train. Just roll your bike on inside the train. Um, uh, and then a little bit further in the back of the picture, you can see a couple bikes in the background. But there's one way that you enter into the space, put your bikes in, and then you get to sit on the other side, which is really rad. Um, to see and to experience uh, one of the last photos for like Q&A, you get to see a couple of uh, my classmates, which were, uh, well, they're all like um, uh, MFA gra graduates, I'm sorry, not MFA, <laughs> graduate students um, with the regional like planning uh, and, and a couple of engineers, there are a couple of planners, there are some sociologist folks too, which was cool. Um, just a mix of graduate students and then a couple of us uh, non-graduate, just working folks. <laughs> um, and then the last slide is uh, PBOT, so Portland Bureau of Transportation's hierarchy of, and I'll talk about this in the next slide, but the hierarchy of um, users, like your, your transportation hierarchy. Who are you, who are you um, planning for or planning around the most? Um, and single occupancy, occupancy vehicles at the very bottom, pedestrians and bikes at the top, which was really cool. So they were, and we met, our two faculty leads were um, John MacArthur with the, uh, with Trek, so the Transportation Research and Education Center, and then Roger Keller, who is, I forget his exact title, but he's the bike guy for Peabot. Uh, <laughs> and yeah, you got to meet him recently. Yeah. Um, and uh, so he, he gave a present, our faculty lead, those were our two faculty leads, and Roger gave a, an awesome presentation and shared some of like, what does is, what is Peabot prioritize and how do they think about the, um, how they're, um, how they're planning their roadways and who they're, who they're planning for, um, which was really dope to hear. And um, it was cool to, ha to hear them say, they got this saying, like, 20 is plenty. So, like, most of their roadways are, like, uh, really slow speed. You were telling me a little bit about that, experiencing that as a cyclist there. And then also, um, they are okay with inconveniencing drivers. So it's like, yeah, we don't care that it's going to take you longer. Oh, this night, uh, kind of like Central Parkway when you get to uh, Ludlow, uh, now, so Central Parkway running into low low before it becomes Hamilton. Yes, you have to make this 90 degree turn. You have to slow down. Just forcing people to, to like um, making infrastructural or like engineering decisions that force people to do it um, outside of just being like, please slow down. So that was cool to hear. Uh, but yeah, the ultimate takeaway from my trip I'd say is prioritizing your most vulnerable user creates a safer environment for all traffic users. And I, I I, I want to bring that back into this space. I, again, I'm only a bike share babe. I can't do terribly too much, but I, what I can do, I'm going to fight for. Um, but that is something that I, I feel um, it was cool to, to, not only with Portland um, and their hierarchy, but also to see that reflected in the infrastructure choices and uh, decisions that were made in Copenhagen as well and from the speakers that we heard from. Um, just like prioritizing the people. Look at how many different users are in this pictures. We got like scooters, we got kiddos, we got like crosswalks. It's just like everybody can have and share these spaces, but we just gotta make sure like our most vulnerable, our most exposed are taken care of. All right, so what do we do here now? Like very different cultural situations and priorities within our uh, different places. So I just got some like, I snapped some pictures of a couple of things that I feel like could be cool here. Again, I, transportation 
realm is new for me, like outside of bikes and bike share, but things I feel like are simple, quick things that would be like conveniences to bicyclists, conveniences to pedestrians, and like kind of demonstrate that you, you care. Um, and so in between those really long-term plans that take a lot of money and take, I tried to capture some of those or what I thought could be possible here. This bike counter uh, next to like a very highly, um, with a, a, a intersection with a lot of tri traffic, it has a daily bike count and then it has an annual, like for the year, this bike count of how many people are passing through this intersection on their bikes. I think if we're able again to like collect that data and share that into community or share that with our politicians or share that with, you know, city business leaders, et cetera, like just to demonstrate like what is happening could be really cool. It's also like, it's a cool thing for like just pedestrians and everyday people to see and other bicyclists. It's like, wow, there's a lot of us out here. Even if we might not see each other all the time. Um, and then the other two in the middle are just like uh, bike ramps. So just like when we're thinking about stair, I think this is there. These kind of where I've seen this is uh, like smell. Um, there's the <laughs> same, <laughs> but just like little conveniences again for bicyclists or like for I don't know what whomever else might need to carry or roll something down um, a stairwell. And then these lean. I don't know what they're exactly called, but these lean to kind of like when you are at a stoplight and you need to like push off and go like kind of quickly or if you let's say you got a lot of weight that you're carrying maybe a couple of kiddos maybe groceries things like that being able to like lean at the stop but then it'd be able to push off fairly quickly when you are um, needing to go and kind of get in front of or ahead of traffic so it was I feel like the like again convenience is to cyclists making it easier making it more visible bike racks I feel like fix it stations a lot of that stuff we're already doing here but I think that um, those are pretty cool and like kind of in between those longer bigger plans you're demonstrating to people that like you care and there's like work being done and that we're supporting this community um more drastic -y kind of things <laughs> so this is uh the picture on the left this is wild to me i again not a transportation planner yet maybe but uh <laughs> So this is on a bus rapid transit line in Aalborg, so like northern Den Denmark, and they put these like sand pits and so that cars can't drive through them. Yeah. Uh, so, and they have these like bump outs. So it's just like not like this only fits where the, and you, we see it a little bit now with the speed humps that are coming up and they have like cutouts for like emergency vehicles, but you know, some of us, our cars are wide enough that we can also avoid them even though that's not the idea. But just yes, making it inconvenience, again, like a great demonstration of like making it inconvenient for drivers. So many people would like, people got trapped, that's what I heard. People got trapped and so they made them a little smaller. But <laughs> they, they used to be bigger, they used to be a little bit wider. But people got trapped in them, people didn't love it, so they made it a little smaller, they put the little bumpers inside. But yeah, making it inconvenient for drivers and just saying this street, this pathway is not for, it's not for, uh, there's bike lanes on the sides, but it's not, it's not for cars. This space is for other users, alternative. Um, and then on this, uh, this bridge, I forget exactly, this is in, uh, Aros in northern Den Denmark um, and people pedestrians here really wanted to be able and cyclists wanted to be able to cross this bridge um, it's a rail bridge um, but they so after like three years of like conversations etc um, they put just a uh, not a cheap but like a kind of a cheaper Instead of building another bridge, they just added like a, a five foot walkway on either side with like some heavy, sturdy, amazing plastic material, whatever. Um, so affordable, affordable response to like people, bikes, pedestrians, et cetera, want to cross this, this space and they can't. Um, so how do we respond to that? Um, what do we do here now? That's like, that's more costly. These are more serious ones. And the other ones that I shared in the, the previous slide were just like, could, could we put those up like in a matter of months? Um, but just showing that it's possible, just showing that it's possible to like choose to change or showing that it's possible to do something different. And I guess my final thoughts uh, were just like all these places that we admire, Copenhagen, Northern Denmark, Sweden, uh, cool things in Chicago, cool things in LA, cool things in all the places. Think of the place that you're like, man, I loved biking there. I loved walking there. Those are all choices that people made. That's a built environment sort of space. Those are all choices that people made. And we can choose to behave and change the way that we're doing things. And it's a lot of our work 
not exclusively ours alone, but it's our work, I think, to just like keep advocating for that change and to keep challenging people to decide to do that. Give them conveniences or show them that it's possible, show them these examples in other places. Um, so yeah, it was an amazing opportunity. I'm really grateful that I got to go. I hope I brought back some fun, exciting encouragements. And uh, I think that's all I got. Yeah, that's all I got, and we can chat. Yeah? Q and A. Right here. Um, it's warm in here. <laughs> Got a long sleeve shirt on. Jody, I have a question. So you were getting to chat with these uh, designers, people around the city. I think you mentioned the. Uh, the train system is called Metro. Uh, it's got a longer name, but I am not good at Danish. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I guess what really resonates with me and what we realized through doing any type of change in our very car-centric community <laughs> is the amount of pushback. Yeah. What um, I like the most that you're sharing is that they're okay inconveniencing car drivers, yeah. right? A car already gets from A to B so, so fast, and I'm preaching <laughs> to the choir in this room. Sure. Yes. But uh, can you tell me a little bit about, did you get any sense like, we do think of these places as like, wow, it's a great place to buy. They're so progressive and forward thinking. Did they used to be car cultures? Like, I guess I don't know enough about the history of Denmark. Yeah. Did they have to push back on that? Did they share about the bad old days or the good old days based on who you were talking to? Yeah. Um, so again, I'm not nuanced in all of it, but yeah. that did come up because it's just like, well, how is this possible? Like, yes, you did make a decision ultimately. So I think it's in like the 60s when a lot of the push for more bicycling infrastructure came about. And a lot of it was because they were broke as hell. So they didn't have any money. So they got really resourceful. And who are your resourceful folks? People that are doing kind of fun DIY sorts of things. People that are biking, people that are coming up with um, alternatives because they don't have X. And so a lot of it came from that and also um, just policy leaders at the time, just like what is the cheaper, more um, affordable option? That's what I'm gonna I'm gonna say. I don't remember everything, sure. but it did come in, in the 60s. Did you come across like car addicts there? Like I, I think about my time just in even Amsterdam, somewhere that's mm -hmm. very centric on bicycle and pedestrian. I did not ride a bike in Amsterdam. I was a little scared, honestly. I'm gonna oh, say yeah. that, yeah. <laughs> With the tracks and the cobblestones, yeah. I was like. I'll walk. I walk like 20 miles a day, though, so I felt yeah, good about it. Nice. Yeah. I definitely got my steps in. <laughs> yeah. Did you encounter any car people? The people like, man, this sucks. I hate all of this. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of merging communities, so like people coming from elsewhere that maybe it's not as bike oriented. But I think it's just it's very much a part of. I would say from my handful of weeks there, very much a part of the culture to be biking. And it's like, there's so many more conveniences for bikes. It just is like, that's kind of the easier choice. They've made it the easier choice, right? But they're like, anytime we were out biking and somebody like honked or something, I was like, where are we? Like, <laughs> do they not know where we are? Like, yeah, so there's definitely some of that still. And like, people love their cool flashy cars. I'm not that guy, but like, people are into that. But it's like, it because of the kinds of Again, conveniences, the ease, the like, what is most advocated for, like that, both like in cultural, like societal sorts of things, but also in like the decisions, like infrastructure wise or choices that people are making policy wise. It just, it, it was, you saw more people biking and, and doing biking or walking rather than, there's a lot of like um, delivery drivers and um, like m mopeds and stuff in the, in the bike lanes also, which they encourage, which I thought was kind of interesting. But yeah. yeah. Did people actively say, Okay, inconveniencing cars, or is that kind of 100%, summary? 100% said that, yeah. yes. That's, I mean, that's bold. Can you oh. imagine Even spectrum? Portland people said that, and I was like, <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Anyone else? Yeah. yeah, it's it's a huge, it was, I think sometimes in the conversations that we had with people, all of us Americans there were like, well, that's just like not the the heart of like who's in charge, right? Yeah, yeah. So how do you change that? Mm -hmm. And I think I think maybe it's just like showing these examples and making it make sense for whom you're pitching it to. So like how do you if you're talking to car owner business people, how do you make it make sense for their bottom line or for what they're doing? Just like yeah. just being good at like finagling things or whatever. Yeah. But it was really like just I I would say 
very culturally different, but it's like, well, how do you change those sorts of things here? Yeah. Um, I don't know. To your point, uh, <laughs> Sorry. I've been having conversations online and with friends where so often like, oh, let's think about bicyclists, let's think about you know people in wheelchairs, like kind of the common things we always say. I've been introducing to the conversation, let's think about people spending money mm. at local businesses, and that seems to ring some new bells for people. Yeah. Because money, the dollar rules. People First, on foot and on bike spend more. Exactly. Mm. Spend more. Yeah. And, and just like, how do you make it make sense for the person you're trying to convince? Yeah. Yeah. I, I think. What's up, Carrie? Sorry. No, you're good. Um, so my perception of the uh, Netherlands is that it's very flat. Mm -hmm. I was just curious if you would experience any infrastructure having to deal with drastic elevation changes and how that compared to Cincinnati. Yeah, there's not a ton of e-bikes there. I was, um, and it was definitely flatter. So I, I have bike share brain. I'm like looking for all the bike share bikes, which is mostly dockless bikes and like not a lot of e-bikes. And it is, it was fairly flat. Um, I will, I mean, you're climbing bridges and things like that, so you got some inclines there. Um, I think when you get a little bit more into like rural spaces, it's a little bit more hilly. But um, your actual question was it just like, did I? Can you say your question one more time? Sorry. Uh, it's more like if there was a unique experience or design element. Like a pommel lift or something for Ooh. bikes, you know? Um, those, the super highways were pretty cool. Also, their bike lanes in general are like, it's like roadway, parked cars, raised two inches cycle track, and that's your bike lane, and it's probably like freaking 10 feet wide or something. And then you got two inches uh, curb and then sidewalk. Uh, so it's just like, the I never experienced a, um, like a raised cycle track. That's really dope. And then... Uh, a cool thing that I really love that's super simple that like I want to do just on my own sometimes just like spaces where you know that people are going to like bikes or people anybody who's rolling anything um, is going to like merge onto this track just little asphalt like little asphalt like I don't know columns just to make it easier to, for people to ramp up I think about that with the new Central Parkway stuff and I'm like let me let me like a little ramp or something like just like little those were everywhere just little and you know they deteriorated in a certain amount of time just pay like just put them down again like how long does that take how much does that cost I have no idea but it seemed like a, a convenience for bicyclists and I like that but this the race cycle tracks were cool and the the cycle super highways went out like super far and they like some of them wrote like are next to the highway like here's the fence and like here's wooded area maybe but there's like this just like bike lane essentially a raised bike lane that like flo flows out really f like miles we rode out to the danish technical institute and that was like you know our ride from the center of copenhagen uh i took a bike share bike with dockless bikes it was not there when i came back and then i took the bus and the train so <laughs> multimodal day <laughs> what's up bike service uh, with the new bridge and the new types of infrastructure. Do they have a say in that? Or are they on the a committee or a committee up there doing anything to actively try to promote that better? To promote? The Riverfront Commons idea to promote anything. Okay. Really listen, if they have a dollar amount vested already in here in the community, sure. do they have a voice that, that say, hey, we, we show the data, this is what's coming into our area. Mm -hmm. We talk about collecting data nodes at certain intersections and stuff. And they put down those bikes where they feel that the money's going to be more prominent. Hmm. In these communities like ours, is there, well, they're saying we're, we actually see an uptick in that. We need to be more pedestrian and proactive because we're seeing more sales in that. Is there a way we can tie into that hmm. to show the people, hey, there is a money dollar value here, there is an incentive? Sure. Uh, so I do want to say Red Bike is a nonprofit. We need money <laughs> uh, we don't have like money to be like just thrown out there i wish um so yeah we don't like um all of our expansion and growth is either like somebody like uh grants like federal grants that we like new bikes all that kind of stuff like we'll be all electric by 2025 that's federal dollars that we've applied for things like that um so it's not that we uh how do i say like I don't know. I'll, to answer your actual question, uh, we can share some of that uh, those that data. We have like a publicly available dashboard from the past couple of years of like what stations are most popular, the kinds of use, the kinds of riders, that kind of thing. That's just like on our website, um, and we're able to do a little bit more of that data. Um, 
we have a little bit more data and evaluation available to us thanks to some of the other grants that we've applied for with the Better Bike Share Partnership that I was talking about earlier and then some other stuff that we're doing with Interact for Health. Um, but we're, we're willing to work with and share data and information with folks. I think we know a lot of the, the key players and parties uh, in both in Cincinnati and uh, Northern Kentucky, but it's just like our people inviting us into those spaces. Maybe we should be doing a little bit more to like get to, to be in those rooms, but I think we're willing to it, yeah. We're willing to be in them, yeah. 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 I think so. We just we just um, where the city just we became we're a part of the city budget now. Like we're funded through. Uh, we just got a chunk of money from the city, um, and so we there is a level of reporting to them that we're doing in this upcoming year thanks to this new funding um, and thanks to some of that data that uh, and, and evaluation work that we've been doing for the past couple of years with that grant and we're able to continue to do it for the next few years too. So we're down. We're down to share. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, city of Cincinnati. We'll take it from whomever, though. Oh, in Copenhagen or? Oh, so our group, so the class that I was with, with Portland State, uh, most of the people were from, Port everybody except for me was from Portland, and we were all like, you know, 20s to 30s, but like Ooh, people, Oh, dude, so one time I was like hanging out behind, right in behind, like it was a range of people. I would say still a lot of like adults, but then you got the cool cargo bikes, electric and not, that would be hauling like three people in the front of it. Wow. Like, in the, truly. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, so like. Little kids and self-sidewalk. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, I think you get. I feel like very early. Again, only split a handful of weeks there. But you also have you have things like the traffic gardens. You have um, more residential kind of streets or like courtyards. Courtyards were huge. Um, so here are these big, amazing buildings. And in the center of them is this giant shared courtyard. And so they have their own like design and amazing things going on. But there's like, we got to tour a handful of them. Um, and there's just like little tracks in there for kids to be riding on, things like that. So early, and, like with Stradler bikes. And then they maybe level up to like going to um, uh, the traffic gardens and things like that. But I saw definitely like young kids with their parents or, you know, with somebody else on their own bike, sometimes not, um, just like on the, the cycle tracks, like on the bike lanes, like commuting. Yeah, don't you think that's a major issue with cycling in America is the safety that nobody feels safe on the road? Sure, yeah. I mean, how to address it. I mean, that's my major issue. I don't feel safe out there. Yeah. I, I mean, I think, I think having the, the spaces like where I feel like there's, there's also a level, I think we heard too, like there's a level of education within like schools and classes, like, like as the people are aging, um, that they just get more familiar with biking. That's not something that we necessarily have here. Um, it, I, I would add too, oh, go ahead, sorry. No, we're cheering, we're talking together. It's great. Um, we did temporary bike lanes for the people in Newport, and when we had painted lanes that were dedicated, we did see young parents come out with young kids when they mm -hmm. were painted lanes. So, I mean, that's only one instance, and they were only up for a couple of weeks. But yeah. Interesting. I would say, too, like just having. A grant to show the city leaders that this is yeah. possible. It was painted with chalk paint. It was just a. Uh, physically separated physically separated yeah yeah i think different infrastructure infrastructure choices where they're protected painted those kinds of things that definitely encourage really awesome. yeah as money but yeah <laughs> but i think yeah it's definitely like if i would say and i think maybe most of us in this room like infrastructure when there is that protected safe infrastructure um that you feel more inclined to have your young, your little one with you or something. Or you feel, like I was saying to you earlier when I first got here, like the fact that the North, it's not even open yet, the North Bend bike lanes. Like I just ran into a guy who happened to be in College Hill and I said, oh, how do you feel about those new bike lanes? And then he was like, I might actually ride my bike. I might actually do that. And it's like, that's so awesome here. Same with, <laughs> yeah, I was, I was like, I wish I was recording him. <laughs> and the same with like, <laughs> the same with Central Parkway. That's not completed. The two-way part is not completed yet. And it's like, I see a few, in my commutes, I see like a few more people just like on that. And it's like people, when they when they see that or know that it's available, they're more inclined to use it or do it. And I think many of us in here know that. And we just got to keep advocating for that to be the case. There's more questions, sir. I, I was just going to say to the woman over here, 
here. I was shocked last summer. I went on vacation with my sons over in Germany and in Denmark, and we were floored. We were on a train, and a bunch of second graders got on the train by themselves with their little bikes, parked their little bikes on the train, went down into the city, got That's off awesome. the train on their bikes, and then rode through the city, which was way busier than our city. <laughs> and all the Americans were floored. We're just staring at them like, where is your mother? I don't understand what's happening. <laughs> It was awesome. very common, and they were very little. Um, so awesome. I think it's just training early, because everywhere, everywhere we went, and when I was in Copenhagen, <laughs> we laughed that, yes, the bicyclists rule the road, because I got yelled at in Danish. I don't know what she said, but I knew I was in trouble, because <laughs> I walked into the bike lane. I was like, my bad, sorry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I to jump out of the bike lane. But Commuting in the... a lot more power than cars. Commuting in the, I love the transition. I think, I, I feel like I'm a decent, strong cyclist, but commuting in the bike lanes when there's like so many people in the bike lanes and the etiquette of like the schooling fish, like we're moving over this way and then you pass this way. And da, da, da. I, I loved it. A number of my classmates absolutely hated it. Everybody was safe. Everybody was fine. But it, it, it's it's really cool how, how, strong every, how strong a cyclist everyone there was. Sorry. Mm. There are like three, maybe four kids that live on my street. I've been on my street for 15 years. Awesome. And these kids have been here a year and a half, maybe two. And they would only bike on our street. Oh. And even though we're like one, two, three, maybe three blocks away from the North Bend, the, t the currently being built North Bend bike lane, mm -hmm. these kids are biking to school now. And it's they rad. never did that before. They only bike on our street. It's rad where it was quote unquote safe. Yeah. And now that there's a bike lane, they're biking to school. And I think their parents are allowing them <laughs> yeah. to bike to school. So absolutely, if you build it. That's it. Yeah, and making it just, like, that's helping to make it more visible, too. If your people are seeing other people biking and seeing other people biking in their own neighborhoods, et cetera, that's, like, really powerful for, like, safety in numbers and, like, just the visibility of biking and that you're going to see bicyclists out on the road, I think. One-lane roadways, uh, highway intersections, bike lanes, crossing over the freeway, etc. The closest red bike station is actually a 15-minute walk. Um, As with Charles, east. yeah. And you know, you're talking about if you build it, they will come. You know, there are donors that donate to the museum center and the collection of museums that kind of have a consortium. How would you say? we can leverage those opportunities to get these really strong hubs, these institutions in our city to be safer to bike to, number one, and then number two, just have a red bike station that would be funded through their donor base. I say yes to the second. I, I, I don't I don't know. I think I agree with you that that's something that like there are a lot of donors, foundations connected to a lot of the institutions within our cities, within our communities, and there are ways that we could advocate for them to prioritize transportation and mobility as part of their core missions as well. That's something that came up when we were talking to um, the Swedish tra traffic safety person, I'm forgetting his name right now, and he was saying that he just came off of the um, Vision Zero, like international conference or whatever, and he said one thing that came up for them is like, how do we get more companies, institutions to just take the same way that they take on climate action and climate, you know, these are the kinds of changes that we're going to make as an organization to to reduce our impact with X. How do we get them to do that with traffic safety and with like pedestrian, bicyclists, whatever, just like roadway deaths, roadway fatalities, roadway like incidents. And so how do we get, I agree and I have the same question I guess, is how do we get institutions within our community to, foundations within our community to value their impact to Tra traffic or transportation, I don't know the answer necessarily. Um, I'll think with you. That's not the best answer, but that's what I got. Yeah. And I can add um, specifically about the uh, connection to um, Union Terminal. Mm -hmm. um, I was down there a few years ago um, on Ezra Charles with my wife and kids. And we were walking around, and my wife's like, this will be a, a perfect place 
for mm -hmm. uh, a multi-use path. Mm -hmm. and yeah. Let's call it the Arts Connector from Music Hall. Ah. Boom. To Union Terminal. Straight down Ezard, yeah. So Hub and Weber drew it up, and uh, this, we, we talked to the city about it, and they said, yeah, this is a good idea. And they said, we're going to build it. And that was last year. They said we had some leftover cool. money, and it never happened. Mm. Uh, so I'm not sure what happened there. But I feel like that's a saga in our communities too. Yeah. Is like, how do you hold it folks is, accountable for those things? Yeah. yeah, is we need everybody speaking out on what the priorities are, mm -hmm. uh, because if it's just a conversation between us and DOTE, mm -hmm. it's never going to move forward. Yeah. And Julie and Felicia here from College Hill, Mark from College Hill, can attest to that. That we really need the community to push it, to drive these conversations forward. Mm -hmm. So. And that was phase one of the Arts Connector. Phase two was to go from Music Hall up to um, Mount at, um, to Eden Park. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Wow. At the Art Museum. Yeah. Well, let's start today. <laughs> <laughs> let's start today. <laughs> right. uh, I have uh, uh, a question online, and then we'll go. Uh, There's lots of hands. Yeah. Uh, so, Chow is having a big conversation here online. Cool. Uh, he wants to know uh, what uh, interim uh, things that they're doing over there that maybe we could copy um, where you know, we're not ready to, we don't have the funding to build it permanently, but are, what are some of the things um, that they're doing to you know, quick test? Yeah, I mean, like I was sharing earlier with those, like anything that's like a convenience to, I think about bikes a lot, so I, I may be missing some of the conveniences for pedestrian stuff. But uh, just anything that's conveniences to bicyclists, like those little asphalt like ramps that I was saying, that just makes it easier for bicyclists or anybody rolling, strollers, uh, wheelchairs, et cetera, to like ramp onto spaces, um, or like into lanes or off of, out of a lane into something. I think all of the work with like fixed -fix stations, bike racks, et cetera, like that's a lot of that is like based around like campaigning, I would say too, about like just getting it into people's visibility and mind that like bicycling is happening and that people are biking. Um, those, the lean to sort of racks, like when you need to push off of, like out of an intersection, um, I think bike bike share like that's a that's a, that's an investment, but that is like you know we're quick uh, <laughs> if there's funding. Uh, but uh, anything that's like interim conveniences for folks um, and campaigns, and I think a lot of the work that uh, ride leaders and bike communities are doing is also really good because not only do you need infrastructure and stuff, but you got to have friends in the process of like that social infrastructure of like. Oh, I, I want a bike, but I, I don't know. These are my barriers. And so having friends in that process of like people to show you safe routes, safe um, sh roadways, streets, et cetera, and to take you on those group rides. Like you're talking about safety earlier. I never felt confident riding my bike alone until I rode in a ton of group rides. And then those group rides got smaller and smaller. And then I had to get myself to the group ride. And so I just got became more of a confident cyclist by participating in those. And I think that social infrastructure, we have a decent amount of that in both of our, in, in our cities. Um, and I think that like, that's a, a key component of it too. And just like advocating for and sharing those, um, all the folks that are leading rides and events and encouraging people to bike and classes and things like that. I think that's very valuable too. Can you elaborate further on the concept of social infrastructure? Uh, I stole that from Obai in um, uh, Chicago. Uh, Equiticity is the organization that he works with. Um, bike share community uh, and then like bike riding group leaders. Social infrastructure would be any organization or people that are working directly with, I would, this is my understanding of it, uh, any organization or people that are working directly with people who are riding, walking, and doing, like encouraging them and like teaching them the skills to be stronger, more confident, more comfortable, et cetera. I think that that's social infrastructure. And I think that bike share plays a role in that social infrastructure. Again, I, I made that phrase, the gateway bike, because um, maybe you use us for a while. Maybe you are a cyclist already and you don't really need us, but like you get that one off bike to some meeting that you got to get to, you needed a bike in an emergency. Like, just like the, the folks that are connecting people and encouraging them and making them a little bit more stronger and confident in the, the ways that they access and use the uh, transportation tools around them. I would say also social, social infrastructure, 
Cam with Metro being your commute concierge and kind of teaching you how to do, uh, how to use the bus system. I think that that's what within the social infrastructure world. All of our work with uh, as advocates, I think that that's a part of that social infrastructure work too. Um, I was I was loving the conversation about Union Terminal. I actually yeah. was having lunch with Gio Rocco today, and, <laughs> and somehow Union Terminal came up, and I said. And so I'm loving this conversation about connecting bicycles to Union Terminal because I was talking about what a shame it is that Greyhound is liquidating Further. its real estate assets across the country in almost every city in America. And it's really going to be up to the cities themselves mm -hmm. to supply a location for Greyhound. And of mm -hmm. course, inner city transit is essential. Mm -hmm. And so what kind of conversation can we have about with connecting bicycles to Union Terminal, but also getting the city or whoever controls, whatever entity controls Union Terminal to house Greyhound, which might be not next to downtown like it was right now, but it's, it's further out now, yeah. and mm -hmm. connects to the Amtrak, so at least it's kind of like a, I don't yeah. know, might be a great place for it in the future. So That's a cool I'm idea. Just yeah. saying that to put that in the future, <laughs> Place that in there. there. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. Hey. Yeah. Um, I was curious if you would start to uh, interact with bicycle pedestrian safety advocacy organizations. So, like, somebody like Tracy Trail, who's by the Red Bike, Novo Bicycle Co op. Um, mm -hmm. And, like, how do they work together? And what was that sort of synergy? Yeah. I feel like we have great synergy here. There's a lot of, like, the a lot of the bike organization and it maybe because we're like a mid-major i think that there's a lot of flexibility within that space of like we're not too big that we don't know each other um but we're not too small that we're like the same two people doing all the things um but your actual question i didn't actually get to meet a lot of like we met i would say like a notch above or like a notch separate um like a lot of planners architects um like s state like tra traffic like safety folks, which was really, really amazing to be in those rooms and to be like being able to like ask them lots of questions. Um, so I didn't get to meet a lot of that. There also wasn't like, I was a little bit surprised that there wasn't as much bike share talk as um, I would have hoped for, of course. But it's also like, I think I was, I sh this was shared, but it's like bike shared plays a different role in, in those spaces than in, in, in Copenhagen and Denmark and more places in places where bicycling is already a part of like the culture, I think. Um, and it's more like tourist oriented, whereas here it's like, I think we have a, there is an element to tourism and like visitors, but a lot of it is just like, how are people getting around to like point to point, and especially as the system continues to grow. Um, but the, how do people work together? I feel like there's a lot of Anecdotally, there's a lot of like cooperative housing in um, Copenhagen and a lot of like a lot of people on the same level. So that's a very different thing than here in the U.S. And um, a lot of cooperative spaces or like social housing. And I don't know a ton about it, but I I'm very eager to learn a little bit more about that. And so like there's a lot of uh, grassroots organizers within those spaces that I would be curious to, to, to learn more from. spent most of our time in Copenhagen, so we didn't get to talk to them. I know the same course the previous year was spent time in the Netherlands and in Denmark, and so there was more of that connection before, um, but we didn't get to have that conversation there. But that's really cool. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm really appreciative of all these questions. I can't answer them all, but there's definitely, there's definitely people in the room who can, so I like that we're talking together. <laughs> biking into their lifestyle and as you know like I commute all over the city do a lot of errands on my bike and 
bike. And the bike parking is often an issue. It's yeah. time consuming. Like just even tonight, same as usual, I'm a lot of talking on my bike, thinking what do I leave I saw you out there for a second, yeah. <laughs> what do I leave on my bike? What do I bring in? You know, all these and it just takes a while to yeah. set and you know, versus the car, you park it, lock the doors and go. Yeah. And I'm just curious, so you saw a lot of innovation with things like helmets. Um, yeah. Inflatable helmets, I mean, pretty wild. The Hovinger, um, I think that's what it's called. Did you see any innovations with bike parking to just make it easier for people to feel like they have, you know, a, a kind of facility that can be implemented in multiple locations, so it's nearby and close, but also just offers some of that yeah. weather protection, extra security, things like that. Yeah, I feel they did discuss a decent amount, decent amount of that, and that was the, the train system actually talked about it the most, I was saying, uh, Metro. And they, they had a lot of indoor parking areas, but it was like underutilized because people didn't know it existed because it was kind of hidden. Um, and so they're trying to figure out how to, how to navigate that. But then um, they're also, I didn't see this there, but I know this exists here. And I think we have something in Newport. Um, there's the indoor parking facility. Yeah, cool. Thank you. So like there's, I've seen a lot of that in the US and uh, well, I haven't seen it, but I know that it exists. Um, and then also like the different, like I know in, while I was in Nashville, there was um, the Metro bus system was uh, at their different tr um, like hubs or like, like uh, transit centers. There we go. Um, they would have like almost like caged areas where you could have long-term locking and secure parking, but it was, and they would either be covered or like the like fencing cage. Um, so that was something that was implemented a little, a little bit more often. Um, I've seen that in a couple other cities too, where there's like longer term bike parking. I think that's the term that they use for it. But, and then that, that indoor bike parking. Um, I didn't see a ton of, I know it exists in Copenhagen. I did not get to experience it as much, um, but there is just like racks everywhere. <laughs> um, so do people feel like there's like just so many bikes Yes. And if you don't the tame the them, There's if you so don't give them a spot, this is what they were saying. If you don't give them a spot, they'll just be even more chaotic. And so they they really the first picture that I showed them was just like that's at the train outside of the train station. It was just like those two tier racks where you can load your bike on top or below, and those can be long term parking too. But uh, it like that they have to do that essentially because if not, then it would just be how would you walk through all of these bikes? Wow. Like people have bikes that they just leave in other places and they like, when they leave from that place, they grab that bike and then, you know, like that's oh, wow. culturally very different, very wow. cool, but it's just like the bike parking is absolutely necessary. I hope that answered. Yeah. I would just add on to that too. A lot of I used to live in Washington, D.C. I know Caitlin was talking about D.C. Um, and the reason why most of my friends biked or walked or took transit was just the price point. It was too expensive yeah. to do a car. I mean, it's just not an option for most people. Yeah. And that was the big thing there. And it's not too expensive right now here in Cincinnati. You can still drive and park. And, mm -hmm. and so I think that's a big part of it. I like that with the, I'm new to like riding the bus more often. Um, just because I, I moved to Northside and there's a, there's a bus right outside of my place. So sometimes I'm like, I don't want to ride. I just want to like hop on the bus, whatever. Um, but I do feel like there's like a lot of cities in the U.S. also that are doing these like integrations with the busing and biking a little bit more often and kind of thinking about specifically bike share in my brain is like a lot of, there's a lot of conversation right now about like how do you treat bike share as if it's public transit as well? But I feel like there's a there's a good combination of busing and biking to be a little bit more um, useful for people. Um, and I love everything that Metro and Sorter are up to right now with all the ways they're making um, the bus more inviting to people who maybe wouldn't have used it before. And I think that's really dope. My name is uh, Jackie, I'm from South Paramount. All right. I was riding through South Fairmount recently this past weekend, climbing all the hills. That is one way to get to the west side. Yeah. Poor soul on the western hills ride. I'm trying to ride a bike. All of us. Before we can get infrastructure and and planning and stuff, which is a major investment. Yeah. Could we get better? Yeah. Um, we'd like to get a red bike station over on the west side. 
Like, Lower Price Hill. But yeah. that's not that's not enough. I get it. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> people don't know how to get from Westwood or South Fairmount. Yeah. Or, you know, even um, the whole Beekman corridor. Yeah. Over to downtown. Yeah. So if we could get better markings for pedestrians, cyclists, scooters, yeah. whatever, from the west side, yeah. so that we can keep them off the dangerous. Yeah. yeah. I agree, and I think that that's great. I know at the Tour de Crown, which was their first, Tri-State Trails did their first Tour de Crown, just kind of like showing what that the Crown loop will look like, that 36-mile loop, um, both like things that exist and things that are coming. People got to experience, and a lot of, like when people were coming back, I was at my tent, and I was at the Red Bike tent, and I was like, well, what did you see that you didn't see before, or that you hadn't experienced before? And a lot of people hadn't ridden along like the Beekman Corridor area. And so I think, again, social infrastructure, people being able to experience that and see that, the community bike routes that we, we were working on, like people get to see and experience like what what uh, low stress, street, the, the low stress um, bike map, or uh, the street map, like that's, those are tools and resources that we can like share into community a little bit more as advocates, but then also just like making those things a little bit more available to people just so they know what, um, what are the ideal or safer streets or like what are your cyclist recommended areas, um, things like that. But I also agree that like signage is really helpful too. And I think that there are models in other cities. I can't think of anything specifically right now of like how to share that but like definitely places that are doing it really well like signage wise um, that we could we could borrow from and learn from for sure Yeah, I feel like that's a great like suggestion and a great like way to approach it. Oftentimes when we are citing stations, I would say I'm not the operation side of things, but it's also like what's available, like what exists currently that we that's not going to cost more that makes this available to people in this area um, as soon as possible. And so I, I absolutely hear you that like and I know the corner that you're talking about and like the interesting like the fact that there's a bike lane there, but like how do you get to that? That's kind of wild. Anyway, but like, um, I, I totally understand it, but sometimes when we are citing areas, it's just like, how do we serve? How do we try to serve this area? Because people want us here. We want to be here. But like, what's available that doesn't cost even more money that would delay or delay this or et cetera? But I think you're totally right. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely, yeah. All right. <laughs> We like new ideas. Yeah. <laughs> It's in the realm. And there can always be yeah. a station at the terminal with bikes. Once the yeah. So for the people that couldn't hear, there was a mention that the streetcar may be expanding. For the people who couldn't hear, 
um, he was mentioning that there is the opportunity or they are thinking about expanding the streetcar to reach Union Terminal. Did I get that wow. right? Yeah, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> I, this is my first time hearing about like the, the east-west connection. I'm into it. And people have been talking about wanting a red bike station at Union Terminal for many moons. It's like hard to like, I like it. I think it's a good idea, but it's also like, it would be essentially on like private property. So then like, like the access and use of that and like how do you get to that station or da 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 So, but I hear also with like some of the work that's uh, eventually coming down the pike with, um, pipe with um, Lynn Street. There's some some opportunity with red bike stations and, and as well in that and that and those plannings. So, again, funding, nonprofit. We work real hard to fight for grants and find those grants and like sponsors and all that. If you know anybody with extra coin, sup? What's up? We we do good work. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Yeah, so tomorrow, um, <laughs> Tuesday, September 15th at 6 p.m., we are meeting at the Red Bike Station at Sawyer Point. We have three of the, I think, 10 or 11 Cincinnati City Council members who will join us, mm -hmm. um, hoping to get maybe a couple more last minute. But we'll be riding a short, like, eight-mile route, really highlighting new improvements on the Central Park and Central Bike Lane. Um, but it's an opportunity to ride together with uh, you know, aspiring candidates who are looking to hear from their constituents, uh, ride on this uh, new infrastructure, give them the, our feedback, and, mm -hmm. and then take a minute to let them talk about their values and their platform. Which three? Yeah. <laughs> Reggie Harris, Mika Owens, and not Mark Jeffries. He's actually out of town. Mm. Uh, but we all know that Mark Jeffries I think you're right, yeah. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> awesome. Meet the candidates right tomorrow. Six. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Um, let's give Elise a big Woo. round of applause. Thanks, y'all. I could just, like, sit down. I'm just going to sit. <laughs> just uh, one quick announcement before we break. Um, so what can we do next? Um, take action on the 4th Street Bridge next Monday, Newport City Hall, 7 p.m. Um, oh, yeah, Jody's saying, hey, if you haven't scanned in, please uh, scan in uh, so we know who is here and we'll add you to the email list. Uh, but uh, um, the 4th uh, Street Bridge is going to be replaced. Uh, KYTC is in the design phase. Uh, there's some key issues here. Uh, we want um, that we're advocating for is complete tear down and rebuild so it aligns with the street grid in Covington. Uh, this is, will be the fourth bridge at this location and they aligned the other three up with the street get, grid in Covington and this one they want to have this weird lane jog. Uh, that it's streetcar ready. Uh, the state is not considering mass transit, large BRT or streetcar so we want to make sure that the Newport City leaders hear that if you feel like that's a priority. Um, three drive lanes for a safer crossing. Uh, they want to expand it for more drive lanes. In Cincinnati, we're reducing the number of drive lanes. And uh, unfortunately, the state of Kentucky is behind the times. And uh, even though traffic peaked in the 1990s and it's now 47% of what it, what it was then, they want to add more lanes. Um, and uh, they're, they're saying that they will build fully separated bike lanes, um, but they also said that they are now over budget um, on their design. So we know that in the past, things like this have been cut. So we need to make sure that the city leaders are hearing us. KYTC will be there as well, mm -hmm. but they hear that this is our priority. Uh, we're proposing a compromise of a very large 16-foot multi-use path on the north side 
which will get nice views. People could um, you know, stand off to the side. If you've been to the Portland Bridge, um, you know, they could have little bump outs where people could take in the view. Mm. Um, and that will save them money from building two smaller uh, lanes, which they probably cut one out anyway. Mm -hmm. So um, please come Newport next Monday, 7 p.m. Um, even if you don't live in Newport, we want to support um, everyone in Newport and you can um, do public comment. So thank you all for coming. We've got seven pizzas. I'm on my bike. I, don't, I can't carry them back. <laughs> so please eat. There's also salads there if you don't want pizza. Yeah. Um, and mingle amongst yourselves and talk. And um, I'll be around for a while if you want to chit chat as well. So okay. th thanks again, for Elise. For sure. Yeah. Elise spent 5,000 miles <laughs> to bring this back to us. Thank you. For sure. I brought a handful of Bike Joy stickers also if you want one. They're really fun and cute. They're over there. <laughs> Whew, it's warm. I'm at a I'm mad. Jeremy's like, I don't think I can take it. Oh, yeah, thank you very much. I'm sorry. Matt, where do we get Vision Sun? Where do we get Vision Zero shirts? Yeah, these cool shirts. I think it's in Kentucky Transportation Cabinet. Hey. Just to see what the options are. Never tried.